The content of this podcast is provided for general informational purposes only and is not intended as, nor should it be considered a substitute for professional medical advice. Hello, this is Karen Nickel, family nurse practitioner, and you are listening to Itchy and Bitchy, a podcast that provides answers to your many unanswered health questions. Before we get started on today's episode, I want to remind you about my course for perimenopausal women. After speaking with many, 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 many women who are in this phase of life, I have developed a comprehensive course to help address the symptoms that so many women experience in their 30s, 40s, and early 50s. I've launched the prototype. It's a live version of the course, and I did so on January 31st of this year, 2023. And when this eight week course is complete, I will produce a pre recorded version of the course. If you would like to talk to me about the course to see if it is the right fit for you, there is a link on our website, itchyandbitchy.com and our Facebook page, I and B podcast, where you can schedule an appointment for a zoom call with me. I look forward to speaking with you. You know, you may have been hearing all the hubbub about gas stoves. Um, My ears perked up when I first heard of the potential dangers of using my gas stove because we have a gas cooktop. As a matter of fact, I have always cooked with gas cooktops. So when we moved to into a new place 11 years ago and it had an electric cooktop, I thought, oh, oh, no, 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 this will not do. And I had a gas line installed so that I could install a gas cooktop. So now, 11 years later, I am thinking, oh, no, no, do I need an electric cooktop now? Yikes. So I thought I'd share with you what I've learned about using gas to cook and what I am thinking about doing to deal with it. First of all, what are the advantages of having a gas cooktop besides my being used to it? Gas can be cheaper than electric in most states. The energy costs are usually 10 to 30% lower than electric, which can really make a difference if you are cooking for a large family. You have instant control of heat from high to low instantly. It heats faster. It's more versatile for grilling, searing, and simmering. The temperature is much easier to control. The stovetop is easier to clean. Now, I am constantly cleaning my stovetop, so I'm glad it's easier to clean, so they say. Works well with many different types of pots and pans. You don't have to have special pans to cook on a a gas cooktop. And most chefs like to cook with gas stoves because they heat up faster. They can use a lot of different pans, including those without a flat bottom, and cleanup is easier. Some cons of gas cooking, besides the main issue, which I will talk about in a bit, are turning them on is not as foolproof as an electric stove. Sometimes the burner won't light. If you have a pilot light on your stove, it can sometimes go out. We have an electric starter, so that's not an issue. We never have trouble starting our gas cooktop. And the burner flame can be weak, and the gas can create a greasy surface. To me, those cons are not bothersome enough to get rid of my gas cooktop, but the issue that has been recently shared in the media has made me stop to reconsider my stance on the matter. Recently, when during an interview, an official from the U.S. Consumer Product Safety Commission, the CPSC, hinted at a potential ban of gas stoves due to associated health risks. Supposedly, there is no current ban on a gas stove or no plans to have one. However, in this statement, the official from the Consumer Product Safety Commission said, quote, any option is on the table. Products that can't be made safe can be banned. The CPSC chair who didn't make that statement, the chair jumped onto Twitter after that statement and countered with saying, to be clear, I am not looking to ban gas stoves and the CPSC has no proceeding to do so. 
Hmm. We shall see. Gas stoves have been linked to negative health effects for decades, but this official statement has reignited the debate about the use of this cooking method option. It is estimated that 40 million households in the U.S. use a gas stove, so it is a debate that affects millions of people nationwide. Next up after this break, I will share the risks of cooking with gas and how to reduce that risk. Be right back. Welcome back. In December 2022, very recently, a study that was published in the International Journal of Environmental Research and Public Health reported that 12.7% of asthma cases in children across the U.S. are linked to the usage of gas stoves. Asthma and respiratory conditions can worsen from exposure to the pollutants that are byproducts of burning fossil fuels like natural gas. Of course, after the statements from the CPSC, gas stoves quickly became a political talking point, which I will not go into. I know, I'm I'm hearing a communal sigh of relief out there. I would recommend that you do not make any decisions on how you cook based on what politicians are saying. That's much I'll say. Rather, to help you with your decision making, I will share with you what experts have to say about how dangerous gas stoves really are to our health, who's most at risk of negative health effects, and what you can do to keep yourself and your family safe. Sound good? So in the process of burning natural gas, nitrogen dioxide, carbon monoxide, and formaldehyde are released. I know. Nitrogen dioxide is particularly worrisome, according to experts, because the levels of this byproduct can become fairly high during indoor cooking. Long-term exposure, long-term exposure to nitrogen dioxide can increase a person's risk for asthma or other respiratory conditions. Even short-term exposure can lead to wheezing, coughing, or difficulty breathing in those with asthma or other respiratory conditions, and increases hospital visits. In addition to causing or worsening respiratory conditions, nitrogen dioxide exposure from gas cooking in the unborn or very young children was associated with cognitive and attention issues in young children. The EPA, Environmental Protection Agency, reports that long-term exposure to nitrogen dioxide might also be associated with cardiovascular issues, diabetes, and cancer. However, the report doesn't state how much pollutants from traffic also contribute to these risks. There have been about 50 years of study on the risks of gas cooking on human health, and most of the evidence points to higher risk among children, especially the risk of developing asthma in childhood. Children are generally at higher risk when exposed to air pollutants because they have higher breathing rates than adults, and their immune and respiratory symptoms are not yet fully developed. When evaluating data in this recent study, it was determined that children have a 42% increased risk of having asthma symptoms if they live in a household with a gas stove. I'm just going to say that again. 42% increased risk of having asthma symptoms if they live in a household with a gas stove. However, the risk is not just about the presence of a gas stove. The risk increases when the home is small, has poor ventilation, and doesn't have a range hood that vents to the outdoors. 
Smaller homes that are not well ventilated have a quicker buildup of hazardous pollutants, so those residing in the home have higher risk for developing respiratory conditions. The other concern, beyond the direct negative health impacts with gas stoves, is the environmental impact. Burning fossil fuels contributes to climate change, and even when the burners are not in use, gas stoves emit almost two and a half million tons of methane, a greenhouse gas, into the environment every year. Two and a half million tons of methane. Now, this is a collective number. This is not your personal stove emitting two and a half million tons of methane. It's collective. Also, a gas leak could occur, which could pose other health and safety risks. Okay, so the argument for taking out my gas cooktop is pretty darn strong, but dang it, I really want to be able to keep cooking with gas. I looked into getting an electric induction cooktop, but I just can't seem to pull the trigger on that one. So what can we do to mitigate some of the health risks if we want to keep, or we can't afford not to keep, Or we're a renter who has no choice but to keep our gas stove. Well, there are some options to reduce risk. If you have a range hood which can vent fumes out of the kitchen, use it every time you cook, not just when you burn something. I have to admit, I'm terrible about this. And so I'm teaching myself to turn on that vent hood every time I cook, even if I'm taking three minutes to fry an egg, I put on that vent hood. And I'm getting better at it, but I'm not perfect yet. But um, the other option is to open windows for a few minutes when you're cooking, when weather will permit, of course. You can do what we did in our home, start cooking with more plug-in appliances. We now have an electric kettle, an air fryer, a crock pot, an instant pot, and of course, Uh, not instant, insta pot, and of course, a coffee pot. These measures reduce our exposure. However, we just got an email that our air fryer is recalled. I mean, we just got it two days ago. Our air fryer is recalled because it can catch on fire. Wow. So sometimes it feels like you can't win for losing, but hey, all we could do is try. So if you don't want to or can't take out the gas cooktop, you can purchase a single or double countertop induction cooktop. A single burner will run you about $50 to $100, and a double burner can set you back about $100 to $200 or more. But it's a much cheaper option than replacing your cooktop. I know, I've looked into it. It is highly unlikely that a ban will be placed on gas stoves that are already in place, so it's important for those of us who have gas stoves to do what we can to mitigate the risks. If in the future there is any legislation to ban gas stove usage, it would likely be implemented for new builds through building codes. Berkeley, California was the first city to disallow any gas in new constructions. That happened in 2019, and since then, 94 cities have changed their building codes to either require or prefer electric for new builds or renovations. There is a group of activists who have submitted a petition to HUD, Department of Housing and Urban Development, to phase out gas stoves in public housing. So if your gas stove is about to bite the dust, or if it's already bit the dust, or if you have been wanting to make a change in your kitchen appliances, now would be a good time to make that change to an electric or electric induction stove. Right now, the Inflation Reduction Act, a Biden administration initiative, does have funding for electric appliance rebates if you are interested in replacing your gas stove. You could receive, for example, a rebate of up to $840 on a new electric cooking appliance and up to an additional $500 to help cover the costs of converting from natural gas or propane to electric. If you need to upgrade your home's electrical panel in order to accommodate an electric range, 
or for that matter, any other electric appliance upgrade covered by the Inflation Reduction Act, such as a as certain electric heat pumps or or clothes dryers, you could get a tax credit of up to four thousand dollars for that expense as well. So it's a good time, good time to make those changes. In terms of qualifying for those rebates, each state will have their own framework, but by guidelines, it's supposed to be based on your household income compared to the median income in your area. For more information, you can just Google the inflation, I want to say inflammation, that's the word, my word in my vocabulary, (laughs) comes right on out. The Inflation Reduction Act, just Google the Inflation Reduction Act, um, and make sure to go to a .gov website versus a commercial website. Go to a .gov um, website for your state to get that information. So my head is not wrapped around replacement yet, but in the meantime, I will do what I can to help our home and environment to be a safer place to live. And I encourage you to do the same. I also encourage you to visit our Facebook page, INB Podcasts, where you can leave comments or questions for me. Our website is itchyandbitchy.com. There are blogs on that site with some of our subjects available for you to read. On the Facebook page and website, we have the information about how to schedule an appointment with me. It's a Zoom call, so we can chat about my perimenopausal course and how it can help you if you are going through this phase in life. I really encourage you to set up a call with me. As always, thanks to Forrest Winsel, our producer and composer of our theme music, and again, the person who actually does the work of putting things on the website and Facebook page when I say we will do this. Thank you, Forrest. Check out his album called An Awful Lot. Go to wherever you stream your favorite music to listen. If you don't know where to stream music, you can find the album on Apple Music or Spotify. And as always, remember that your health is in your hands. (laughs) 